This is the Intuitive Colorimeter Mark III. It's an instrument for illuminating text with coloured light so that patients can find a colour that reduces the distortions of text that they see when they try and read. There are three intuitive dimensions of colour. There's the hue itself, then the strength of colour or saturation, and the brightness. These are independent dimensions. The hue wheel here controls the hue setting. This slider controls the saturation. And these two control the brightness. So this reduces the brightness to a half. This one reduces the brightness to a quarter. And the two together reduce the brightness to an eighth. When we begin an assessment with the colorimeter, we turn the colorimeter on at the back to setting one, and we ensure that the hue wheel is set to zero, the slider is set to zero, and both the attenuators are in. We prepare the colorimeter record form with the patient's name, date, and so forth, and address, and then we're ready for the patient. Okay, so now we need our patient. Let me introduce Susan Smith. Thank you. Hi, Susan. Hi. Um, if you'd like to take a seat and move the seat forward. Now, inside there, there's some text. I'd like to ask you some questions about that text. Are the letters and words clear or difficult to see, would you say? I'd say they're okay too. Mm -hmm. Do they stay still or do they move? Well, they stay still, but they move towards the edges, so okay. they move a little bit. And does the text hurt your eyes or is it okay? Well, I wouldn't want to look at it forever, so... Okay, good. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring coloured light onto the text you can see there, and I want you to judge whether the colour makes the text easier and more comfortable to look at, or makes it less comfortable or has no effect at all. Just as an aside here, if the patient was clearly finding the text very uncomfortable, then we, we don't want to go through the procedure because they'll end up with a headache before you finish. So what we do is we reduce the amount of text they're having to look at. But Susan's discomfort isn't extreme, and we need to have a certain amount of discomfort in order to have symptoms to measure. Okay, so I'm now going to bring the first colour onto the page. And I increase the saturation at hue zero, and I do it progressively over the course of about five seconds, leave it there for about five seconds, and then bring it back. Now, we're back at white now, Susan. Did the colour that I brought on make the text any better, any worse, or did it have no effect, would you say? Um, I'd actually say it was a bit worse. Okay. Thank you. Was that a lot worse or a little worse? Um, a little. Okay, thank you. And now we're going to advance the hue by 30 degrees and repeat the process. So I'll gradually move the saturation to 30, wait for five seconds, and then bring it back. Now how about that one? Was that any better, any worse, or no different? No, no difference. No difference. Thank you. And now we advance the hue by 30 degrees again. And each time I'm increasing the saturation, you'll notice that I'm not going all the way up. I'm stopping at 30. There's a little lip on the saturation scale that allows you to stop at 30. And then come back again. We don't want to use strong saturations at this stage. We want to see which are the more comfortable colours. How about that one, Susan? Was again, that... I'd say no change. No change. Right, thank you. And now we advance the hue by another 30 degrees and increase the saturation again slowly to 30. Leave it there for five seconds and then return. That's a, a little better. A little better with the colour, was it? Yes. Okay, and now we advance the hue by another 30 degrees and increase the saturation again. Have the patient observe that for five seconds and then return it to white. How about that one, Susan? That was much better. Was it? Yes. Good, thank you. 
And so we go on like that, every 30 degrees, until we've finished the hue circle. We've been through the whole of the fan chart now, trying each of the 12 colours in turn, and we've found two, one at 120 and the other at 210, that uh, improve the clarity of text quite a bit. Now, we've only tried modest saturations up to this point. We've never gone beyond 30. What I'm going to do now is to ask Susan to adjust the saturation here for herself and then the saturation here so that we've got the best setting of each of these colours and then to choose between them, see which of the two is best. There are some aspects of this machine that are easier for the patient to adjust than others. Saturation can usually be adjusted by the patient unless it's a young child, in which case the saturation is best adjusted by the examiner. Adjusting the hue, which changes uh, colour adaptation, is usually left to the examiner. Now we found two colours that uh, improve your perception of text. I'd like you to adjust the saturation, the strength of each of those colours. And you do it by lifting the control here and moving it away from you. That increases the strength of colour. And then I want you to adjust it as if you were tuning the radio to get it on station. And find the best setting. Off you go. Now normally, of course, the whole examination will be done in a, a darkened room, but we can't film in a darkened room. <laughs> I think this is the best. So that's 120, is the hue, and the saturation is 36. Okay, now we're going to try, I'm going to bring it back to white now, and I'm going to show you one of the other colours that you selected as uh, improving text. It is. Now I want you to adjust the amount of that for me too, please, if you would. That colour is 240, and we're just going to compare those two in a minute. Yeah, I think that's... Up there. Okay. Now we've found the best setting of both of those colours. That one's 21. Which of those two would you say was the clearest most comfortable. Was it easy to tell which of those two is the best? No? Which would you say was better? I think the first one was better. First one. You're fairly confident about yes. that? Yes. Okay, thank you. Good. So we'll select the first of those and we'll work from that one. Now, Susan selected the first of those two, so we're going to explore that one. That was 120, hue 120. We're now going to explore hues either side of that. Okay now Susan, if I, this is the hue setting that you've found the best so far. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask you to look at that setting, get an idea of how clear and comfortable the text is, then I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and I'm going to change the hue slightly by 20 degrees and then I'm going to ask you whether the second one I show you is better or worse than the first. Simple as that. Okay, so off we go then. Head in. That's number one. Okay, now close your eyes. Open them. That's number two. Do you want to see number one again? Yes, please. Okay, close your eyes. Open them. There's number one again. Now which of those two, number one or number two, do you think was clearest and most comfortable? Uh, number one. Number one. Thank you. And now we're going to try the other way. So I showed 120 and 140 on that trial. I'm now going to show 120 and 100 on the next pair. So that's number one, Susan. Okay. Close your eyes and open them. That's number two. And uh, do you want to see number one again? No, I think uh, I'm... You, you're fairly confident that... Yeah, uh, that this is better. That's better, is it? Okay, thank you. So number two... Is better. So, so Susan preferred 100 to 120, so we're going to explore hues either side of that. So this is number one, Susan. Uh, close your eyes and open them. That's number two. And close them. That's number one again. Which of those two did you prefer? Number one. Thank you. So we've bracketed the preferences now. Susan prefers 100 to 120, but she does not 
prefer 90 to 100. We could explore a little bit more around that. But what I want to do now is to take her revised preferred hue and ask her to readjust saturation at the revised hue because what we're trying to do is to find the best hue and the best saturation by comparing each successively, one after the other. So, could I ask you please to revise your, your strength of colour setting? If you can just make sure you've got the optimum setting there, please, Susan. Are you happy with that? Yes, I'm very Okay, happy. good. So what I'm doing is tracking Susan's preference on this target chart, which is a chromaticity diagram, and she's found a hue of 100, preferred to 120, but she didn't like 90 over here. So she's somewhere in this region, and she's readjusted saturation to 36, so she's about here. We're going to explore settings either side until we're sure that her settings are consistent and she's reliably reporting uh, the best clarity and comfort of text with the setting that she's chosen. After manipulating the hue and saturation in turn and ensuring for our own satisfaction and that of the patient that we found the best uh, chromaticity um, possible, now you want to offer that with the minimum density of lens. Can I bring that back a bit, Susan? Does it start to become worse? Yes. Right, so, okay, so I'm going to bring a little bit more colour on and you tell me when it's acceptable yeah. again. Okay, thank you. So you want to find that um, strength of colour that is just sufficient to reduce the symptoms, but not more than is necessary. Okay, so now we've minimised the saturation setting. The next stage is to use the attenuators. These are the attenuators. This one reduces the brightness by 50% and this by 75%. Now, the attenuators do not indicate the need for a grey lens. What they do is to indicate whether um, we've reduced the symptoms sufficiently and they also indicate whether uh, the patient can tolerate um, a dark lens. They do both of those things. I'm going to explain how. Let's suppose that I pull this out and I ask Susan whether it's better when it's bright like that or when it's dark like that. Dark. When it's dark. Now, she prefers it dark. That might be because when we reduce the saturation, we've reduced the benefit slightly. And so she now needs the text darker in order to um, uh, have the comfort that she has experienced. So we push that back in and we restore the original setting of saturation and we repeat that. Now, is it better when it's bright like that or dark like that? Not bright. And now she can tolerate the brightness because she's got that little bit of extra colour. So we evidently need that little bit of extra so we can't reduce it as much as we did originally. If that wasn't the case, if she still prefers it dark like that, then we have a compromise. These attenuators indicate the effect of luminance on the subject's judgement. Now, in Susan's case... She prefers it bright, which is fine for most colours, but there are some colours which, let's suppose she needed a really strong colour and she also wanted it bright, that's, that's not possible because strong lenses, strongly coloured lenses, take light away. So we then have to work out a compromise for Susan between the strength of colour she needs and the darkness of the lens that she can't tolerate because she prefers it bright, if you remember. But if she preferred it dark, and she wanted a strong colour, then that would be all right. Now, the computer programme that comes with the instrument helps you with this procedure. The computer programme that comes with the instrument can help in this trade-off between saturation and luminance, because it helps to indicate whether 
the lenses that provide the colour that the patient has chosen will be bright or will be dark. It indicates what attenuator setting you need in order to approximate the uh, brightness of light that you would get um, with the lenses. In Susan's case, she's um, chosen a moderate saturation and uh, that's easily provided with lenses that um, are not dark. Had she chosen a stronger colour, say right up at the end of the instrument, one might want to discuss with her later how strong a lens is she need. If she'd chosen a setting right at the end of the scale, the strongest setting possible, there is the possibility to consider that she may have needed a still stronger colour in order to get the best setting. Now, there's a limit to how strong the colours can be in the colorimeter, because our experience has shown that stronger colours are usually so dark that the patient doesn't want them. But it's worth checking that, because the, you can easily make stronger colours with combinations of the trial lenses shown here. Now we've found the best hue and the best saturation and the best attenuator setting and it's time to use the computer program to tell us what coloured trial lenses we need to get that colour. And it tells us that we need yellow 4 and green 3. So we take each of those and put them into the trial lens holder. We then change the instrument over to white light and ask the patient to hold these up as if they were glasses and to look into the colorimeter and to say whether uh, these lenses are as good as it was in the box just now. Yes. Oh, yes. good. But, uh, that uh, is what you hope your patient will say. Um, thank you, Susan. Um, so that combination of tinted trial lenses provides the information necessary to dye the spectacle lenses that colour. So the prescription would be uh, green, C3, yellow, B4. There's one last consideration. Do we need to add an ultraviolet blocker or not. The program will tell us whether we need to consider adding an ultraviolet blocker. We don't need to consider it if the lens it has already uh, removed the uh, ultraviolet part of the spectrum. But we need to consider it if the patient wants to use the lenses out of doors. And the ultraviolet lenses are here in the box. And they do make a small difference to the colour of the lens and some patients are sensitive to that and sometimes they uh, decrease the effectiveness of the lens. So you need to check that. So I'm just going to ask Susan whether the trial lens combination with the ultraviolet lens in is as good as it was in the colorimeter just now. Yes. Yeah, are you happy with that? Well, in that case, we just add the ultraviolet blocker. Normally, we would choose to add it unless the patient found that the change in colour was, was detrimental. The next stage is to ask the patient to try out the trial lenses under typical lighting conditions, as big a range as you can offer, um, while they're doing a task such as reading that they would normally be required to do and check that the lens is still keeping the text still and uh, making it comfortable. So that was the examination procedure. You'll notice that we've ended up with the same colour lens in both eyes. And that's what this procedure is designed for. Just occasionally there may be indications that a patient may prefer a different colour in the two eyes. In our experience this is extremely rare. The sort of occasions where this might be the case are patients with MS who have a history of optic neuritis in one eye, patients who have other 
ocular pathology that's confined to one eye. Or, just occasionally, you'll have patients who report seeing colours differently in the two eyes. In those patients, it may be worth comparing slightly different tints in the two eyes, and the way I would suggest you do that is to offer up the lenses and then increase the saturation in one eye, decrease it in that eye, and then do the same thing in the other eye. In other words, altering the tint from the binocular standard that you've achieved using the colorimeter. You can use the uh, trial lens program to help you select the lens combinations that you need in order to do this. Now that uh, Susan's gone, we've got time to uh, review some of the decisions we made during the color imagery procedure. And so the decisions were made with the help of this uh, spreadsheet that I have up on the computer here. We entered the hue and saturation in these boxes and the spreadsheet gave us the lenses to try out, the ones that match the colorimeter setting and you can see that they, they do match the setting reasonably well. With these settings the computer program tells us that to obtain the same luminance as they've got in the box in spectacles we don't need the attenuator. That is to say the setting with the attenuator in is the same roughly the same luminance as they would obtain in office lighting wearing the lenses. The spreadsheet also tells us whether we need to consider an ultraviolet blocker. You'll notice that the spectral transmission of the lenses still leaves a little light transmitted down at the far blue end here. If the lenses had been darker then they'd have cut out that light and we wouldn't have needed to consider adding an ultraviolet blocker because there would have been no point in doing so. Now remember that these attenuators don't indicate the need for a grey lens. They indicate two things. Firstly, if the patient prefers the setting with the attenuator out, it may be that you haven't reduced the symptoms sufficiently and they need just a little bit more colour. If they prefer a strong colour with the attenuator in, then they may not be able to tolerate the lenses because the lenses may be so dark in order to get that strong colour that they may not tolerate the darkness that is simulated by pulling the attenuator out. The spreadsheet indicates the level of the attenuator that best approximates the level of lighting when the patient's wearing the glasses under office lighting. And here you can see with the pair of lenses that um, Susan's chosen, the appropriate setting is no attenuator, and so we don't have to worry about it. If she'd chosen a different colour, let's say a hue of 200, with a really strong saturation, that can only be provided in lenses that are really quite dark, that transmit only 18% of the light, and to uh, simulate that lighting level, we would need the attenuator out. But in Susan's case, we don't have to worry about that. Other features of this spreadsheet include a record sheet for your practice records, and a handout that you can give to your patients that uh, tell them whether the glasses are likely to interfere with traffic signals. And that information is given in detail in this sheet called Signals. And the chromaticities of the lenses are shown in the next sheet uh, that shows the chromaticities under various types of lighting. And the likely efficacy of the lenses under different types of lighting theoretically is shown in the next sheet. For example, some lenses uh, are less effective under tungsten light than they are under daylight and this would be indicated here. Of course we select the lenses under light that is, has a chromaticity halfway between incandescent light and daylight. We select them under um, fluorescent light. And that's the reason we use it, really, so that we get a good compromise between those two alternative types of lighting, incandescent and daylight. This sheet provides alternative uh, 
lens combinations that will provide the chromaticity that's been selected under different types of lighting. If the patient's, for example, only going to work in an orchestra pit where the lighting is incandescent, then you might want to consider using a different tint. And that's given here. The next sheet tells you how typical your uh, lenses are compared with those of other patients. And if you're a scientist and want to look at further types of analysis, all the details of the spectral transmission of the lenses are tabulated in this sheet. And the last sheet enables you to calibrate this program for your particular instrument, although normally the program will be supplied calibrated to the instrument that you receive. Mm -hmm.